Hi, and welcome to the 50th in our series on Middle Eastern Islamic history. Today, we're going to talk about the early Republican years in Turkey, the reign of Atatürk. Atatürk was president of the Turkish Republic between the years 1923, when he was first elected, and 1938, when he died while in office. Um, and so this is going to cover uh, his story. For those of you who are not familiar, these are the rules. This is not an academic presentation. I'm not accredited in history, philosophy, religion, or any of the topics that we will be discussing today. That said, this will be a secular presentation. I'm going to try and give a non-biased view of Ataturk. Um, that may include negative uh, aspects about his personality as well as positive aspects about his personality. And... That said, uh, given the subject matter, let's be respectful. But that said, I love interactivity. Questions, comments, clarifications, please put those in the chat. I do read the chat and will respond in real time. What I like to say is that these presentations are a 101 and a 201, meaning that if you don't know anything, I'll catch you up. And if there's something that you already know, I'll probably uh, build on that. That's the 201. There's also going to be a two-hour hard stop, so if there's anything that I don't get to by the end of two hours, I will not advance any further slides, but I'll stop there, and um, that will be the end of the uh, presentation, but I will continue to entertain questions um, as we go on. When I put dates below a person, that typically refers to their years of service, um, not when they were born and died. And... Finally, like all other elements in this series, um, this is a recording that you can watch later. All other 49 entrants, as well as everything else, can be found at our YouTube page. Please subscribe to our YouTube page, as well as uh, if you like what you see and you think that it's worthwhile, please send a donation. We appreciate those donations. It costs money for us to maintain Meetup, Zoom, and YouTube. Um, so while we... Um, aren't charging anything for you to come and see what we do, we would appreciate uh, your support and uh, those links are in the description. All right. So one of the things that we had discussed is that um, in 1876, the Ottomans tried this parliamentary system, but Sultan Abdul Hamid II basically crushed it um, at the end of the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 to 1878. And the reason he was able to do that is because this war devastated Turkey to such an extent that he could literally just turn around and blame uh, the situation on them. And a, he was able to consolidate power from 1878 onwards um, until he was deposed in 1908 in what was called the Young Turk Revolution. He wasn't uh, completely removed. Uh, his power was substantially weakened by the new uh, assembly that was convened by the Committee of Union and Progress, which was one of the parties of the Young Turk movement. Then you had a situation where the, uh, there was a struggle in 1909. Uh, the Sultan was removed uh, and Mehmed V assumed power. During that time, there was a lot of contentious power shifting between the various groups, and the Committee of Union and Progress came to power um, as a result of the Ottomans losing in the Balkan First Balkan War, and that led to the CUP triumvirate, the Committee of Union and Progress, uh, taking power just before the onset of World War One. And we talked about this in depth uh, in episode uh, forty and forty one. Now we mo we mentioned that the Committee of Union and Progress, which was the ruling one state party during World War One, was a party committed to two elements. One was Turkification, and the other is Turanism. And so we should really flesh out what these are, because during Ataturk's period, these will become even more important. Now, Turkification is the idea that the variety of peoples within the Ottoman Empire, especially those of Muslim religious heritage, be they worshipping or not, um, were in truth Turks. They should speak the Turkish language, they should connect to the history of the Turkish people, and they should see themselves as a Turkish nation. Um, and that is Turkification. Turanism is related. It's the idea that there are many Turkic peoples, people who speak Turkish languages naturally. We're talking about, for example, the population in, in Anatolia, in Azerbaijan, in Central Asia. All of these populations uh, speak Turkish languages naturally. And of course, there are languages that are related to Turkish languages. 
However, distantly, like Mongolic or Tungusic, which are spoken in certain areas of Siberia. And so you have this idea that there is a great Turan nation, Turan being one of the historic names of Turkey in Persian. And so you have this idea that um, the Turks all stood together as one unified country. But of course, in reality, they were divided between those areas under Russian control, those areas under Persian control, those areas under British control, those areas under Chinese control. Um, at this point, it would have been uh, the, the Republic of China. But um, the Turanists believe that there should be a union here. And the CUP embraced both of these ideologies. Um, and while they're not responsible for what was called the Sun Language Theory, they were responsible for the end of the Ottoman um, plur pluralism uh, that existed. So, for example, if you look back in 1900, this is before the CUP took power in 1913, you have a sign that's in Istanbul. On the top is in Istanbul Turkish. You can see it using the Arabic script. Then below it on the left-hand side is the writing in Armenian. Below it on the right-hand side is Greek. And this is typical. A lot of signs would be in multiple languages responding, uh, corresponding to the multiple identities that existed throughout the Ottoman Empire. You can also see that Turkification was performed on non-Turkish uh, Muslim populations in the empire. Uh, you can see below, this is a Rushdie school um, in Jordan, uh, where the Arabs in Jordan were Turkified, despite being, uh, despite being Muslims. There's a question as to whether it matters in the concept of Turkification or Turanism, whether the Turk in question is a Sunni Muslim or a Shiite Muslim. It does not matter. Um, now, we're going to see throughout the reign of Ataturk within the country of Turkey, right, because he's going to have a slightly different political philosophy than exactly what I described here. It's going to matter whether you're Sunni Hanafi or not. Hanafi being the school within Sunni Islam uh, that, uh, that was the official permitted religion. But um, within the concept of Turanism, what mattered was the language and historical identity. And in fact, uh, we're going to discuss what is a Turk, because that's part of the development under Ataturk, um, how that came into existence. Now, the CUP, as I said, led the Ottoman Empire through the disastrous period of World War I. And during World War I, the Ottoman Empire was targeted on five fronts, right? You have the, uh, the Gallipoli campaign, which was the defense of Constantinople uh, and the Straits of the Dardanelles. You have the Caucasus campaign, which was the Russian invasion of Eastern Anatolia. You have Mesopotamia and Palestine, which were two British campaigns designed to roll up the Middle Eastern Arab majority territories of the Ottoman Empire. And of course, you have the Arab revolt, which was the British instigated uh, uprising of the Sharif of Mecca to try and create an Arab state. And it's really important to realize that the Ottoman Empire by the time that World War I had rolled around, had been in nearly a century of conflict. All of these wars basically took the period from 1804, when the Ottoman Empire first became involved in the Napoleonic Wars, to 1923, the end of the Turkish War of Independence. You had this continuous set of wars that really challenged the Ottoman Empire, and almost all of these resulted in large-scale civilian deaths, um, they resulted in military dislocation um, and were incredibly disastrous for the integrity of the Ottoman Empire. One comparison that I've made a few times is the relationship between the French losses in World War I and the Ottoman losses in World War I, where the Ottomans, despite having a national population that is roughly half the size of France, they lost two thirds of what France lost in terms of military personnel, and they lost a significant amount of civilian population. Now, of course, of that 4.2 million, roughly half of that is the Armenian, Pontic, Greek, and Assyrian genocides and the Great Famine of Mount Lebanon. That's certainly factored into that number. But another 2 million of that, roughly or so, um, are Muslim civilians. So you had a massive um, death rate throughout the country and a difficult amount of healing, such that the Ottoman Empire lost 3 million more people than the French did, despite having less than, uh, despite having roughly half the population. And so in 1918, 
the Ottoman Empire in order to stop the bleeding, signed the Armistice at Mudros, and the CUP leaders, the Committee of Union and Progress leaders from that triumvirate went abroad um, as allied troops marched into Constantinople and the empire um, would come under the control of the Entente powers. Now, this is where the battle lines were on the day of, uh, of the armistice. You can see that red line sort of extending through the southern uh, portion of the Ottoman Empire, really uh, showing that the British have control of the Levant and Mesopotamia. But you can also see that the Caucasus was under uh, control of the Ottomans at the time of the armistice. And we covered that during the Caucasian Wars uh, episode that we did last week, uh, what happened with the Ottomans in the Caucasus. Um, suffice to say for this episode that the Ottomans could not hold their position in the Caucasus and eventually signed uh, armistices with Russia. Now there's a question, did the hundred years of war result in large scale starvation, infrastructure collapse, or were the deaths strictly confined to warfare? No, it absolutely resulted uh, in infra uh, not as much infrastructure collapse, but societal collapse. Turkey of the, I'm using Turkey anachronistically here, of, not, of the early 1900s was a primarily agrarian society. So it's not like they had a lot of infrastructure to lose. But one of the mass massive problems is that entire areas of farmland would go, uh, un, you know, would go fallow. You'd have large scale famines. You had a number of brain drains out of Turkey to other countries. You had a lot of major issues holding the Ottoman Empire together um, as it kept being uh, subject to these wars and these invasions, right? Even the invasion from Egypt, which was actually probably the most devastating invasion of the Ottoman Empire prior to World War I, um, the Egyptians almost took Constantinople. They defeated the Ottoman army on several occasions. So it's not just Western powers that are able to take apart the Ottoman Empire. The Muslim world can do it too. Um, which would show you just how weak the state was. After World War I ended, there were a number of different treaties. Most people are familiar with the Treaty of Versailles, but the Treaty of Versailles only addressed the relationship between the Entente powers and Germany. It did not address how the other states that were part of the central powers, of which the Ottoman Empire was one, um, it did not address how these other powers uh, would deal with the situation. And so there were a litany of treaties that were signed towards the end of 1919 and the beginning of 1920, which we addressed in, in one of the earlier episodes. I believe it was episode 46. Um, the Ottoman Empire was the last to be resolved and the treaty would only come out in 1920. But even before 1920, there were issues in containing the Ottoman Empire. And we talked about those in episodes 47 and 48a. But those issues were primarily that there was a Turkish revulsion. And by Turkish, I mean the ethnic group at this point, right? Muslims who spoke the Turkish language within Anatolia, uh, within the Turkish ethnic group, that there was an allied Entente occupation of Constantinople, that there were war crimes tribunals being held by the Constantinople government um, for members of the CUP uh, concerning uh, war crimes and war profiteering from the perpetrators of what we now call the Armenian Pontic Greek um, uh, Assyrian genocides, primarily the Assyrian and Pontic Greek genocides at this point. Um, and the fact that it didn't seem like the Entente powers were interested in recognizing the territorial sovereignty of the Turkish people, that they were going to carve up the territory of the Ottoman Empire. And what ended up happening is that we had an invasion by uh, starting with the Greeks in May of 1919, uh, which stretched almost all the way to Ankara in September of 1921 over the course of those two years. We had a front uh, against the Armenians uh, who were given an expanded state in the Treaty of Sevres of 1920, August 1920, and a war in the South against the French who wanted to take over the historic region of Cilicia, um, all of these regions um, being considered by what were called what was called the Grand National Assembly to be part of historic Turkey. So, right, we have this uh, conflict that sort of brews um, with the uh, disembarking of the Greek troops at Smyrna, as you can see there. 
And in order to resist this and begin to attack the Greeks on the Western Front, uh, secure the territory in the South and the East, uh, you start having what are called defense of rights societies. Um, and for example, this is a picture of one of these societies from Vileta Shurkia. Don't let the uh, name fool you. These are militant groups. And eventually Ataturk, what he did is that he began to bring these groups together and he called it the Cuvia Milia or the National Army. And the National Army began to be the attraction that many uh, began to have an attractive pull on many Turks within the empire in order to reclaim the territory of the Ottoman Empire. Now, to be entirely clear, the Cuvia Milia and the Defense of Rights Society that preceded it were militant organizations operating against the wishes of the Ottoman Sultan. The Ottoman Sultan was fully compliant with the Entente power occupation. And so not only were these defensive rights societies fighting the Greeks, uh, the French, and the Armenians, they were also fought, uh, they were also fighting the soldiers brought together by the Sultan Caliph based in Istanbul. Now there's a question of was there an ethnic rationale for the French wanting to attach Cilicia to Assyria, Lebanon? Um, I think that the French saw it as part of their relationship with the Armenians, and the Armenians had a historic presence in Cilicia, um, and so that's why uh, they wanted it to be a French colony. I don't know if they wanted to attach it directly to Syria or Lebanon, or rather they wanted to administer it as a distinct colonial territory. Either way, um, the, uh, that is not what came to pass. Uh, there's a question of where is Cilicia? Cilicia is the region that I've circled right here on the map. Um, and to be frank, it's not a bad question. The Turks asked it as well, um, because many of the names that the allies had used for the region when they were carving it up were names that Turks simply hadn't used for centuries uh, to refer to these areas. Cilicia was last used by the Armenians when they had a state there about 600 years ago. So, um, so you can see in the upper left-hand side, that's the Kuvay in Zibaltia, the uh, forces of discipline um, that were designed to repress uh, the national army. Those were the forces of the Sultan Caliph. They were defeated by Mustafa Kemal and his primary um, associate, Ismet Inönü, um, the, he didn't have the last name at that time, but it's helpful to distinguish him. Um, so that, uh, as I said, the, uh, the, uh, the Sultan's army was defeated, but the Greeks were not. And so the Greco-Turkish war went on from 1919 until 1922 with Mustafa Kemal being the leader, uh, coordinating the struggle against the Greeks directly and conducting through the use of other generals that he trusted, uh, some even more senior than him in the military, uh, conducting the wars against the French in the south and the Armenians in the east. Now, it should be pointed out that Mustafa Kemal was a party member of the CUP, and we're going to discuss a little bit more about what that means and how that applies um, as we go through. But it's not as if he just showed up one day and was given this command. He had a long history of command within the Ottoman Empire in the successive wave of historical wars. In 1921, um, the, uh, the Grand National Assembly, which was the legislative arm of the National Army that Ataturk was leading, um, and from now on, I'm going to call that Turkey or the Grand National Assembly. I'll use those terms interchangeably, despite the fact that this is not a recognized country by anybody at this point. Turkey reached out to France and to the, and to the Soviet Union and signed peace treaties with them first, uh, both in March and then secondly in October. Um, the March treaties were to sort of end the fighting, ending up sort of as, uh, as complicated ceasefires and the October treaties delineating the borders. Additionally, the treaty with Soviet Russia established a new relationship between Turkey and, uh, and the Soviets, which was unlike any historic 
on uh, relationship that the Ottoman Empire had had with the Russians. As we covered in episode 27 and in numerous other episodes, the Russians and the Ottoman Empire were uh, diametrically opposed to each other. But um, the Soviets desperately needed to secure their southern border. And so a treaty with the, uh, with Turkey uh, made complete sense to them. They were willing to send gold, weapons, um, and uh, advisors uh, to help the Turks win. And in return, uh, the Turks maintained friendly relations with the Soviets um, throughout the 1920s and into the 1930s. You can actually see, this is a picture of Voroshilov and Atatürk meeting in 1933. Um, to discuss uh, what was at then at that time called the Balkans Federation, which never came to fruition, but which would have been a plan for Atatürk to reach out to the Balkan states. The treaty with France ended up um, delimiting the border between what would become Turkey in the north and what would be Syria and Lebanon in the south, with the one exception being the Hatay uh, region, the Alexandretta region, which is color coded there in uh, dark red, uh, yeah, sort of middling red, sort of a coral color, um, and that region would be subject to a plebiscite given the large number of Turks there. Inunu, um, who was, a, as I said, Mustafa Kemal's second in command, you can see him there in the uh, dotted circle at the Lausanne conference, um, signed uh, the Treaty of Lausanne with uh, the Greeks with uh, a number of other potentates that would recognize for the first time in 1923 that there was a new and independent Turkish Republic and that Turkish Republic uh, would replace the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire would be no more, but it took a long time for them to come to that resolution. They started negotiating in mid-1922 um, because remember, Smyrna fell um, in September of 1922. And in, uh, the signing of the Treaty of Lausanne didn't occur until late until 1923. And the reason this negotiation took so long is that Ismet uh, Inonu uh, refused uh, to take on many of the historic concessions that the Ottoman Empire had made to the European powers, such as capitulations which is where Christians within the empire would have certain trading privileges, as would foreigners. He refused any financial restrictions and refused that the Ottoman Empire would pay any war debt for World War I. He also argued that the Straits should be free for travel um, as opposed to uh, the, British, uh, the British position that there should be increased regulation of the Straits. Now, there's a question as to uh, when did he go from Mustafa Kemal to Atatürk? Um, that's as a part of the surname law, and I'm going to get to that in a bit. All right. So now that we have this, now that we have this sort of map of Turkey uh, coming out of the Treaty of Lausanne, we now have to discuss what is going to happen to this new nation, right? Um, because in one sense, Turkey is the successor to the Ottoman Empire. It's taking over most of its land, most of its people that have that are not under the administration of the Entente powers. But at the same time, it's composed of government officers who operated in complete rebellion to the Ottoman Empire um, and were trying to set up a completely new form of government. So it's unclear entirely um, what is the way that this country should be run. So now I'm gonna give you a little background on Mustafa Kemal in order to sort of explain where he's going to go uh, and why he has the credibility he does um, in the situation we have. Mustafa Kemal was born in the city of Thessaloniki. Uh, at that time it was called Salonika. Uh, it's in Greece today. And he grew up in a relatively secular Muslim household. He went to secular school as a kid. He didn't go to uh, an, a Muslim religious school. And he then uh, decided at a very young age that he wanted to join the military. I think it was as young as 16. Uh, he went to the military school at that point in Istanbul. And he served in several different wars that the Ottoman Empire had fought. Um, you can see the picture there of him serving in Libya. Uh, that was during the 
a war, the Italo-Turkish War of 1911. And that war was a very strange war from the Ottoman perspective because the Ottoman Empire lacked an effective navy and there was no land connection between Ottoman territory and Libya. Remember, Egypt was independent at this time. So, well, somewhat independent. It was under British quasi-control. Um, but in order to get him to Egypt, he would have to go by ship. But unfortunately, there was a blockade led by the Italian Navy, which was far superior to that of the Ottomans. So he actually came into Egypt as a tourist and snuck across the border. And that's what a lot of the Ottomans did, who would end up leading um, the Libyan Mujahideen uh, to fight against the Italians taking the country. After the Greek, after um, several uh, battles uh, outside of Libya, the Ottomans decided to cut their losses and uh, retreated. So after cutting their losses, the Ottoman Empire found itself in the Balkan Wars, and Mustafa Kemal served there too. But his real moment of distinction was during World War I, where he was the leading colonel in the Gallipoli campaign. And as, uh, as I pointed out before, you can see on the map that the Anzac forces, which uh, landed at uh, Ariborno, began to march towards Maltepe, which was a mountain overlooking that brown road, um, which was the only road leading to the southern part of Gallipoli, where a combined English-French landing uh, would take place. If the Australians had taken that mountain, they would have cut off the road, and then the British and French would be able to secure the southern part of Gallipoli, at which point Gallipoli would be lost. And the strategic value of Gallipoli is that it guarded uh, the Straits of the Dardanelles, uh, which lead to Constantinople the capital of the Ottoman Empire. And Mustafa Kemal is famous for his uh, words, uh, ordering his soldiers to march forward, despite the fact that they had no ammunition of any kind, uh, or sorry, they had insufficient ammunition to really defend the position, saying, I don't order you to fight, I order you to die. In the time it takes us to die, other troops and commanders can come and take our places, meaning that um, by holding the position long enough, more Ottoman soldiers can come and prevent the, uh, the Anzac forces, the Australian and New Zealand army from taking that mountain. In, in reality, his sacrifice wasn't necessary. The Australians um, didn't realize that the Turks were lightly armed and therefore didn't engage them, figuring that they'd taken enough territory anyway. But because of that quick thinking on Atatürk's part, um, what could have been the one day that the Anzac forces would have actually won the campaign, um, it turned into a whole year-long struggle in which the British and their Anzac forces uh, withdrew uh, from Ottoman territory. So it was a massive um, victory. And because of Mustafa Kemal's steadfastness here, he built up his reputation as a military commander. In fact, during World War I, he was one of the few Ottoman military commanders who, despite being posted in several different places, never really lost a major engagement with Ottoman powers. So when he begins to see power come to him as a result of his role in the Turkish War of Independence, he has a vision of bringing Turkey towards civilization. And this is sort of, uh, you know, a painting of, a, of Atatürk in the background, uh, showing off with his hand the future destination of Turkey, the civilized world of the West, and that the Turks should leave behind the shambles of the Ottoman Empire. You can see represented by the graves of dervishes um, and mosques and agriculture um, towards that idyllic city and that modern technology. And Ataturk had a vision of what Turkey could become that was very unique. Um, there were others who shared it, but it, but it was a view that very few in terms of the overall percentage of Turkey shared. And in many ways, his vision for the next 15 years as president would be the defining vision of Turkey for the next century. So what is that vision? The first thing is that we're going to address what are called the Alta Ok, or the six arrows. Uh, those six arrows represent the major goals of Atatürk's reforms, and I'm going to proceed, as opposed to going year by year, I'm going to proceed thematically between these different ideologies that compose his 
uh, thought process and which have since become called Kemalism together, right? After Mustafa Kemal, it's his ideology. Now, part of this that's not exactly expressed by that ideology is the idea of creating a modern capital. Now, Ankara had become the capital during the Turkish War of Independence because it was far enough away from Constantinople that the Entente powers that were occupying Constantinople couldn't directly threaten. But Ankara also served as a really great blueprint for a new capital city because it was actually a small village before Ataturk uh, moved the Grand National Assembly there in 1919. And in, yeah, in 1919. So what ended up happening is that he had a template in order to build a new capital city that would correspond to the values that he wanted to bring forward. And you can see um, on this sort of postcard written in French, Ankara Street, right? Ankara built up. Um, you can see the main plaza with large avenues, modern buildings. He wanted to demonstrate what a modern westernized Turkey would look like by creating a capital in its image. And he built massive infrastructure projects like the Ankara train station. You can also see that he wanted the best of the West to design and build the city. So you actually have Janssen, who was a German architect and, and urban planner, putting together the city in such a way that it could be a modern forward-looking city. One of the other things that, we that we're going to see as we move through this discussion is that Ataturk had a number of allies when he entered the Turkish War of Independence, right? That war in 1919 to 1923, when he was fighting to create a new government for the Turkish people. But as he moves through his presidency, he starts winnowing and removing the groups that are most inimical to his vision. So, for example, during the, uh, the period of the Grand, uh, during the period of the Turkish War of Independence, a number of the groups fighting with him were loyalists to the Ottoman Empire. Those loyalists would be cut out when the Republic was declared. We're going to see Kurds who fought during the independence and supported the Republic, but would be cut out when the secularization went too far. And each time you'd have a winnowing of more and more of his opponents um, in order that those who survived, those who continued forward, were those who shared Ataturk's vision for the future and not uh, some of the other visions that existed during this time period. So the first uh, of these arrows that I want to address is quite, what's called Jumhuriyetçilik or republicanism. Now, Republicanism is the idea that Turkey is a republic. It's not governed uh, by a sultan. And I think Ataturk's words during the debate on the 1st of November, um, 1922, are really instructive here. Because there was a debate in the Grand National Assembly, which now that the War of Independence is won, functionally, and right by late 1922, the war was already won on, on the ground. It just wasn't won uh, in terms of having a peace treaty. But... Um, he says here, sovereignty and the sultanate cannot be given to any one by another by discussion or debate. It should only be taken by force and power. The Ottomans seized the sovereignty and sultanate of the Turkish nation by force. Now the Turkish nation took the sovereignty in their hands and by warning these aggressors and by objecting to their sultanate. This is an accomplished fact. The issue is not that if we are going to give the sovereignty of the nation or not. What does he mean by this? There are several important terms that he brings up. The Turkish nation. When he refers to the Turkish nation, he's referring to the nationalistic concept of nation, meaning that there's an ethnicity, and that ethnicity has a certain political will. The Turkish nation, when he speaks of it, is the will of the Turkish people as a collective. That that ethnicity has some sort of political identity and political desire. And in his view, the Ottoman Empire had usurped the role of sovereignty by declaring that it passed through a lineage of sultan to sultan to sultan and the people of Turkey who should actually be the people who are governing haven't been able to govern until they took sovereignty into their own hands and objected uh, to the power of the sultan. Not surprisingly, this led to the abolition of the sultanate. Now, there was a reason why the abolition, uh, the abolition of the sultanate was 
uh, uh, controversial. Um, and in fact, it's so obvious that it's controversial because Ataturk actually had to pass a law in the 15th of April, 1923, saying that those who opposed the abolition of the, uh, of the Sultanate uh, would be found guilty of treason. But the reason was, is that the Sultan was not just the political leader of Turkey, but he was also the Caliph, the spiritual leader of all Sunni Muslims all throughout the world. And so the main debate was not whether or not Turkey would be a republic, but whether the function of the caliph could be divorced from the function of the sultan, and therefore you could get rid of the sultan without getting rid of the caliph. On the 17th of November, 1922, they, the Turkish people decided that that was indeed possible. And so Mehmet VI was removed from Dolmabahce Palace, and he went to live in exile in the British possession at that time of Malta, which is in the Mediterranean Sea. From that point onwards, Turkey would be a republic. And Mehmed VI's cousin, Crown Prince Abdul Mejid II, uh, became the caliph, but he did not inherit the title of sultan. Ataturk utterly refused to give him any pomp or circumstance, as was typical when a new caliph uh, took power. And when Abdul Mejid um, requested additional funds for his office, Ataturk actually sent him a very sternly written letter saying, you do not have the right to uh, send messages to my ministers. In Ataturk's view, the political entity of the caliph um, was not desirable either, but this was an earlier concession that he was willing to make to keep more of uh, those different circles of acceptability within, uh, within his territory. On the 29th of October, 1923, um, Ataturk finally celebrated the independence of Turkey as recognized by the Treaty of Lausanne and declared it the Republic Day. You can actually see this is a picture of the 10th annual celebration of Republic Day in 1933, um, where he stands with a number of ministers, including, of course, Ismet Inönü. So that's the first of the six arrows. The second one is Halkçılık. Um, it's often translated as popularism or populism, which I think is a very poor translation because of the ideas it conjures up in English. Um, a better translation, I would say, is either popular sovereignty or popular will. Remember that when Ataturk declared the Sultanate to be abolished, he did so by saying that it was the Turkish nation which had reclaimed power for itself. And this is the idea of the Turkish nation reclaiming power for itself. The first thing he did was to argue that there was no division between the various peoples of the Ottoman Empire. Historically, as we've talked about, there was what was called the millet system. In the millet system, every person of the various religions that existed within the Ottoman Empire, the legally recognized religions, let's be clear, um, was led by a bureaucracy formed by individuals of that religion, and they would be represented by a chief leader in Constantinople, right? There was the Chacham Basha of the Jews, right? The chief rabbi of the Jews. There was the Milad Basha, uh, the national leader of the Armenians. And there was the patriarch of the Greeks, um, not to mention the exarch of the Bulgarians and a, new, a number of other uh, recognized minorities. This system was completely abolished uh, by Ataturk. And so every person was now a citizen of Turkey and that made them a Turk. This, of course, is a highly contentious term, and we're going to talk about that when we get to the concept of, um, uh, yeah, when we talk about the concept of Turkification. He also removed the power of the elites. The concept of the nation, right, was the concept that all people were equal. And so the ulama, or the Islamic scholars, shouldn't have significant power arrogated to them um, that power was power that belonged to the people. It belonged to the Grand National Assembly. And so Sheikh al-Islam uh, Mehmed Nuri Effendi was actually the last Sheikh al-Islam. This was a historic position within the Ottoman Empire that had existed for centuries. Um, and this was usually the chief Muslim official within the Ottoman Empire. His He became the last and he was dismissed from his post by Ataturk 
as Ataturk was making the country less and less Muslimly religious. We also see massive strides in women's rights. Ataturk gave his famous speech in Kastamonu. Um, in, uh, the speech was given in 1927, but a number of reforms had occurred before that point. Um, in that speech, he said, how can one half soar while the other half is tied to the ground? Right, Referring to, as he saw it, the enslavement of women um, in the traditional historic role that they had occupied during the Ottoman Empire. And so, Uh, there's a question here, actually. Ataturk had many progressive ideas on the separation of church and state, uh, women in education, eliminating the fez, all the citizens. Um, where did Ataturk get this knowledge? Education, study of European countries? Absolutely. Ataturk was a speaker of French. He read numerous books. Um, there are many um, legends about Ataturk and his reading, um, such that he would be traveling um, during the uh, Turkish War of Independence. And of course, times were difficult, but uh, Ataturk would always have a book, always uh, thumb through different ideas, always talk to people. He was a very intelligent uh, individual and very well educated in the Western tradition. Um, and that complemented his military abilities. So that's exactly where he got his ideas. He got his ideas from the West. But returning back uh, to women. So in his view of the enslavement of women during the Ottoman period, he decided to make fundamental changes to the way that women would be living. The first thing is that in 1926, he banned uh, polygamy uh, within the Turkish state. And so only monogamous marriages were legally permissible. In the, 19, in the late 1920s up till 1930, various municipalities within the Ottoman Empire, um, various municipalities within the Ottoman Empire uh, permitted voting. In 1934, there was a national permission of voting, and you can see women in the Ottoman Empire voting. Now, of course, we know in the United States, women got the right to vote earlier, but in many European countries, even Western countries, women did not have the right to vote like they did in Turkey. Now, of course, Turkey was not the first Muslim country to give women the right to vote. That honor uh, was held by the Azerbaijan Democratic Republic in 1918. Um, and it was not the first Turkish Republic. That honor belongs to the Kars Republic. We talked about both of those last time we met. But this was the first sustained government that gave women the right to vote. And women retained that right to vote and have continued. In fact, Turkey has had female prime ministers. He also changed the divorce and custody laws throughout his period in office, such that by the time that he died, um, both men and women could initiate divorce. Both men and women had rights to child custody. Those rights were roughly equal. And men and women uh, both had the right to inheritance. Under Islamic law, um, women did receive an inheritance, but it would be half what, what the man received. Under Ataturk, he reformed it that women and men receive equal shares of inheritance, uh, all else equal. We also see Ataturk uh, promoting uh, education among women. Um, he promoted education among men as well, but he promoted education among women such that if we look at the entire period of his presidency, roughly 10% of the university graduates uh, were women. Uh, one of the other uh, major changes that he made in Ottoman society, from Ottoman society to Turkish society was the promotion of art and sculpture. Now, under the rules of Islam, depiction of humans sorry, under the rules of Sunni Islam as practiced by the Hanafis, which was the majority group in uh, in Turkey. There are other groups that don't have this issue. Um, the depiction of human bodies and animal bodies was a sin that would result um, in God in the hereafter demanding you to bring such an animal or human to life. And when you couldn't do this, because of course you do not possess supernatural powers, um, uh, you would suffer for the sin. However, Ataturk believed that art was a natural expression of the human desire and of the will of the nation, the will of the people, that, that halk that he's trying to promote in Hatchilak. So he opened in Ankara the State and Sculpture Museum in 1927. You can see him there at the opening. In order to improve the artistic output of the Turkish nation, in order for it to realize its true cultural potential. One of the most 
interesting things that uh, happened in Turkey during his reign was what was called the Surname Law in 1934. And the Surname Law um, did what the Ottoman Empire had not done in 600 years, which was give people last names. Typically in the Ottoman Empire, people were known by their name and the name of their father. Um, this patronymic structure had existed for quite a long time. Uh, some people like Mustafa Kemal um, received their second name, uh, in, his name in his case Kemal, um, because of their own accolades. Kemal means perfection, and it was awarded to him in school for how studious he was. But um, you had people like Ismet, right? Ismet didn't have uh, a second name, uh, and that was actually quite common. Um, but the surname law allowed the organization of a modern national bureaucracy to occur, and people were allowed to choose their own last names. In many cases, people chose last names based on uh, what their uh, job was, they chose it based on where they lived, they chose it based on, on their friends, or they chose something that they thought would sound good. Um, but Ataturk himself was given a surname by the Grand National Assembly. They voted in 1934 to give him the name Ataturk, meaning father of the Turks, for the way he had led them up until 1934 at that point, uh, over 10 years, in terms of building a modern nation. Ataturk himself had no natural children. He adopted uh, a number of children who had become orphans uh, during the various wars or uh, those that had specific potential and that he wanted to raise to realize that potential. But since none of them were of his seed, none of them took his surname, meaning that he is the only person in Turkish history with the surname Ataturk, and by law, um, nobody else can ever take that surname. So the next uh, one of the arrows that we need to talk about is Milietçilik, or nationalism. And this was the creation in Ataturk's mind of the Turkish nation. Now, Ataturk struggled with Turanism because Turanism would focus the attention of Turks outside of Turkey. But at the same time, Turanism worked to create the idea of a historically powerful Turkish entity, one that he could reach back to in order to give cultural flesh to the new country he was creating. So he created the Turkish Historical Society that would investigate the claims of the Turanists. Now, the investigation was not a, for want of a better term, level-headed investigation. It was an investigation designed to create a certain outcome. And the outcome of this investigation was what was called the Sun Language Theory, which is that historically, all peoples around the world uh, were originally Turkish speakers. We're talking about 7,000, 8,000 years ago. Turkish was the dominant language on Earth. And because of this, um, those people who did not speak Turkish now had lost it. It had been boulderized and changed into other languages. But thankfully, the Turks of Turkey are the ones who retained their historic uh, son language. They retained this historic knowledge, and therefore they were the inheritors of that tradition, just like everybody else. There are different or there are different arguments as to where uh, Ataturk decided uh, where where Ataturk was coming from in creating this history. The first one is to create a sense of identity firmly grounded in history for the Turkish nation. Another is that he uh, he had issues with um, going to the Westerners, um, and the Westerners had considered the, the Turkish people to be a mongrel race, hybridized between mongoloids and caucasoids. Remember, at this time in the early 1920s, there was a lot of belief in racialism, meaning that the different races were naturally different. They had different aptitudes and abilities, um, the same way that different kinds of finches with different beaks can have different uh, have different foods. So too, the races of humanity uh, are, are of different character. And of course, the Caucasoid race was the superior or master race uh, in this perspective, because this was a perspective advocated by people who considered themselves Caucasoid. Now, there's a comment here that Turkish is a Ural-Altaic language with Hungarian and Finnish coming from the, Mongol, from, coming from the Mongols. Um, I have to respectfully disagree with 
most of that. Turkish is an Altaic language, it's true, but Altaic is an older designation. Um, historically, we found that designation doesn't hold. Um, this is a development that's come in the 80s, 90s, and aughts. And so Turkish, Turkic languages, while related to other things that have historically been considered Altaic, like um, the Tungusic languages, the Mongolic languages, the uh, Yeniseyan languages, um, it's not uh, related to them within the last, let's say, 5,000 years. They don't have a common ancestor. And the Uralic language, the Finno-Ugric languages, which is Finnish and Hungarian, um, are a different branch uh, unrelated to uh, the Altaic languages that I just discussed. Um, so we, sh we should be careful um, about linguistics, but linguistics is an ever-changing field. So now that the Turkish nation is grounded in this history, Atatürk wanted to ground it also to the region of Anatolia. For those of you who've been here since episode 10, uh, you would remember that the Seljuks invaded uh, Anatolia under the rule of Tuhrul Bey uh, about a thousand years ago, a thousand years from our time. It was in the year 1051, about there. Uh, Battle of Manzikert was um, 1071, but they were in the peninsula before. Um, so there was this problem, right? If if the Turks are the people of the great Khaganate, as you can see, Atatürk is uh, at a boys' school uh, seeing the representation of the Turkish historical society, of the great historic territory of the Turkish Khaganate. Um, how was it the case? that Turks were the indigenous population of Anatolia? How were they grounded to this territory? And so the historians of the Turkish historical society said that the Turks were a commingled descendants of these Turkish Kagans and um, the historical peoples of Anatolia, especially the Hittites. And there's a lot of Hittite iconography um, in the early Republican period, specifically for this uh, reason. For example, this is a Anukkabir, Anitkabir is the um, the resting place of Ataturk, and there were 26 of these Hittite lions built um, in order to commemorate the 26 supposedly Oghuz Turkish tribes that were part of Tughul Bey's invasion of Anatolia. Now, together, we have the absorption of these ideas into a new Turkish ethnicity. And this Turkish ethnicity is the one that is represented by the nation. And so in order to create among the people this understanding and cognizance of their national identity, Ataturk promoted the idea of Turkishness quite strongly. In a speech that he gave in the 1930s, he had his famous line, Nemutlu Turkum Diene, uh, happy is he um, who says he is a Turk, is usually the translation or some variant thereof. And this phrase, is incredibly famous. This picture actually is etched in the side of a mountain in Cyprus. Um, it's a mountain under the control of the Turkish Republic of North Cyprus, um, but it faces towards south, the south, so the Greeks can see it on the southern part of Cyprus. But this phrase is, uh, exists throughout the Turkish media uh, and throughout the Turkish world, and it is the aspiration that many Turks have of ascribing to this identity that Ataturk has created, that Ataturk has revealed for them um, as the direction and purpose of their culture and society. As part of the realization of the Turkish identity, Ataturk also realized that the literacy rate needed to increase substantially. When the Ottoman Empire was disbanded, roughly five to 10% of Ottoman citizens could read or write Turkish which was astoundingly low, but not terribly uncommon for countries outside of Western Europe and the Americas. Atatürk consulted with a number of individuals as to what should be done to increase the literacy rate. One uh, particular American school teacher uh, that, uh, that visited Turkey suggested that using the Latin alphabet would be superior to using the current Arabic script. It wasn't a unit, uh, there wasn't a uniform opinion at the time, but many Turks agreed from, with this from a linguistic perspective. The Turkish language um, has eight distinct vowels, nine if you consider um, some of the Eastern non-Istanbul standard dialects. And the Arabic language really only has representation for three. 
Now, there are languages that have used the Arabic alphabet and added additional letters to respond to all these vowels. And that was a consideration uh, before Ataturk, but he decided against it. On the same vein, you have many Arabic letters, which in Arabic have distinct sounds, but in Turkish do not, because the emphatic capacity of a letter disappears. For example, the letter s, th, v, several other letters have the sound of the letter s in Turkish, whereas they have different sounds in Arabic, as I just showed you. And so what would need to happen was the creation of a Turkish alphabet. Ironically, the Turkish alphabet was invented in 1928 by one of the few Armenians that still remained in Turkey. And he was given the name Dilachar, or language opener in Turkish, um, for his work in creating the modern Turkish alphabet, which is still the alphabet that Turkey uses today. And because of the cultural power that Turkey has in the Turkish world today, Azerbaijan, um, Uzbekistan, uh, Uzbekistan um, Turkmenistan have all used Latin script alphabets based in significant part on the alphabet in Turkey. Another part of Turkishness is the resettlement law of 1934. And this is uh, a more, a darker uh, part of that issue. When Turkey was unified as a country physically, it was not unified as a country in terms of its social dynamics. You had numerous towns and villages, especially in rural areas, where the majority of people were not Turkish ascribing. They could be Muslims of a different ethnicity, like Laws or Circassians or Kurds. They could be Christians or Jews or other religious minorities like Alevis. And these people were not ascribing to the Turkish national identity. So in 1934, Atatürk devised a method to shuffle the people around within the country in order to compel them more effectively to assimilate. And the articles, as you can see there, of the resettlement law divided Turkey into three distinct regions. Regions where the number of uh, Turks should be increased. You should move Turks to this region. Regions where um, non-Turks should be moved out of and regions that were designated as off-limits areas or closed zones. These are military facilities, governmental buildings that are top secret, these sorts of places. The reaction to the resettlement law, as you can probably imagine, was not very positive among the people who were forcibly uh, resettled. Additionally, you had animosities that had been brewing uh, among local populations come to the fore when one of, the, one of the enemies in those two situations was being moved. A particularly famous example here are what are called the Thracian pogroms, which occurred in 1934 when the Jews of Eastern Thrace, which is the European part of Turkey, were forcibly moved from their historic location towards Istanbul, where they could be better integrated and assimilated. They were attacked by mobs of Muslims who were living locally in the region and who were suspicious of the Jews, um, given the Jews' lack of involvement in the, the Jews of Thrace, uh, limited involvement with the Turkish War of Independence. Now, it should be made clear that Jews were involved in the Turkish War of Independence on the Turkish side. In fact, one of the negotiators, along with Ismet Dinenu for the Treaty of Lausanne, was the chief rabbi of, uh, of uh, the Ottoman Empire. So there, they were there. Um, but as a result of the Thracian pogrom, um, several thousand Jews lost their lives and many more lost their possessions. Now, before we get into laiklik uh, or laicism, um, we, I wanted to just take a pic look at this picture. This is a picture of the Grand National Assembly as, con uh, as convened at Sivas on the 13th of September, 1919. This was during the Turkish War of Independence. You can notice that most of the officials are wearing Western style suits with the fez. This was um, typical uh, 
westernized Turkish nobility wear. But you can also see um, religious leaders in their typical turbans and coats. This is, of course, not going to be the picture as we move further and further into the Republican period. And we need to talk about that. The next thing that I want to, and we'll point that out as we go along. The next thing I want to point out is that uh, laiklik or laicism is not secularism. It's, laiklik is often transcended as secularism. And I find that to be a definition that's very problematic um, because the two concepts are not the same. Secularism is the idea that the state takes no side in the question of religion. And so religious institutions exist in the public square. They have the ability to motivate people. They operate autonomously. And uh, they are free of government influence. But at the same time, their ability to influence the government is checked. Laicism is the view that religion should be subordinated to the will of the state. Um, and it is the view that religion in the public square needs to be curtailed and minimized. Religion in the public place should be organized by the state. So it's not that religion is free of the state and the state is free of religion. It is that the state is taking the act of controlling the religion. And so we have a number of issues which play into laicism. The first one, of course, is that in 1923, Ataturk passes a number of laws requiring Muslims in the Ottoman Empire to wear Western clothing, regardless of religious position. And you can see some of that Westernized clothing in this uh, false color image. Now, within the Ottoman Empire, when the millet system had existed, the various millets ran their own religious institutions. And part of that was codified in the Treaty of Lausanne. In the Treaty of Lausanne, Armenian, the Armenian Apostolic Church, the Jewish religion, and the um, Greek Orthodox Church were recognized as religions within the, within the Ottoman Empire with the ability to set up their own institutions and run them independently. The Sunni Muslim institutions of the Hanafi school were run by um, the Sheikh ul Islam. But as I pointed out, the Sheikh ul Islam in 1924 and 1922 was excused from his job. And in 1924, Ataturk needed an apparatus in order to manage all of the mosques that existed throughout the Ottoman Empire. And so he created what was called the Dianet, or the, or the religious ministry. You can see this is actually a picture of the Dianet because it still survives. In fact, its role has greatly expanded since uh, Atatürk uh, created it in the first place. But the DNA's function is to organize the religion from a horizontal perspective, meaning that all of the mosques report to the DNA. Um, the DNA chooses the imams that go to the mosques. It it maintain it looks after the upkeep. It is effectively responsible for how it works. Now, aside from these four religions, Sunni uh, Islam, uh, Armenian Apostolic, sorry, Sunni Islam of the Hanafi school, Armenian Apostolic uh, Christianity, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and Judaism. Most other religions of the uh, Turkish Republic were not permitted uh, openly to create their centers of worship. This in particular was devastating to the Kurdish community because a significant percentage of Kurds are either Sunni Muslims of the Shafi'i school, different school, or they were Alevis and therefore not recognized by the system. That said, as part of the laicism, um, Azaturk permitted uh, what was called the freedom of conscience, meaning that people could believe or not believe as they so desired. The creation of institutions was the bigger issue. As I mentioned before, Ataturk was not terribly contented with the um, Islamic Caliphate that continued to exist under Abdul Majid uh, starting in 1922. And 
there was great consternation about what he would do to the caliphate because the caliphate was incredibly popular, not just uh, in uh, the land of the Ottoman Empire, of the former Ottoman Empire, but in the entire world in general. In fact, in British India began the movement called the Khilafat movement. And the Khilafat movement was a movement designed to trigger Atatürk's sympathies and protect the caliphate, uh, perhaps even send the caliph out of the borders of the Ottoman Empire, um, where he could live uh, in a Muslim-majority country. But Atatürk uh, saw the intervention of the Khilafat movement, which began to spread flyers within uh, the Republic of Turkey, as foreign interference, which was just the excuse he needed in order to abolish the caliphate, that the caliphate was a pawn of foreign interests. And on the 3rd of March, uh, he declared the caliphate abolished, and Abdul Majid and the last members of the Ottoman royal house were expelled from the Republic of Turkey. One of the other changes that occurred roughly contemporaneous with the abolition of the caliphate was that Turkey was that the Ottoman Empire had been governed by what was called the Majele, a compendium of Muslim Sharia um, that was put into a code form. So it could be read off like a legal code, but it was the actual verdict of the Sharia. Ataturk banned the Majele and all forms of Sharia within Turkey, and Turkey today remains a country where Sharia is outlawed. Um, and instead, he went to Switzerland and Italy to gather their legal codes, primarily from Switzerland, and implemented those as the base law of the Republic of Turkey. This law would govern pretty much everything, contracts, torts, uh, basic property law, many. And it's really important to understand just how penetrating the Sharia is in terms of its method of governance. First of all, the Sharia um, deals with issues of inheritance. It deals with issues of um, marriage and divorce. It deals with issues of contract. It deals with issues of tort. It deals with issues of investment. It deals with uh, banking regulations. The Sharia is a system that deals with all aspects of a legal code. And so the replacement of the Sharia with the Swiss Civil Code fundamentally changed the business atmosphere and the lifestyle atmosphere within the Ottoman Empire. In many ways, you can see throughout this uh, laicism movement, Ataturk is trying to chip away at the power that religion has over the state um, in order to remove it from the institution of government. Another element of religious bureaucracy was what was called the teke, or the, uh, the sophistic structures. Uh, yeah. And those in those teke uh, existed many dervishes were part of the state apparatus. And so uh, and so Mustafa Kemal ordered all of those to be suppressed. In fact, the whirling dervishes of Turkey only exist now because A, the movement had gone into hiding or uh, outside of Turkey. And then B, in 1950, uh, it was recognized as UNESCO World Heritage. And so Turkey preserves it on that account. But the historic organization of the dervish orders in the Tarikat uh, was banned in 1925. And many of the leaders of those Sufi groups persecuted. Another thing that Ataturk did was he removed the power of Islamic leadership on questions uh, that they had previously opined. And those aren't just religious issues. Uh, in the 1920s, um, the Sheikh al-Islam and other leaders had argued that there were certain medicinal remedies that could be made from several herbs for which there was no scientific backing. Accordingly, when the, uh, when the religious institutions were abolished, he created a number of medical associations in order to refute these claims and insist on actual science as the um, development of cures and uh, other medical information. He also banned uh, ceremonial uh, clothing that could be associated with the Ottoman Empire, um, which is what came down with the hat law, where every uh, fez was banned, as were numerous other forms of religious headgear, and only westernized clothes like the top hat were permitted. He also 
promoted access to education, as we talked about, building schools for both men and women uh, all exclusively in the secular environment. Religious schools were permitted to continue existing, but only as a small uh, development to teach uh, new clergy, not as a general enrollment that would, of course, expand as time goes on. But Atatürk's perhaps most brazen challenge to religion was his desire to shift the language of Islam out of Arabic and into Turkish. Now, the Ivan or the call to prayer um, was tra traditionally given in Arabic, but in 1932, Atatürk commissioned uh, a Turkish version of the Adhan, and from 1932 until 1950, it was illegal to give the Adhan in anything but Turkish uh, in the Ottoman Empire. It was done in order to um, remove the connection to the rest of the Islamic world and center everything on Turkey. Also in 1935, he had, he had published a Turkish version of the Quran. This was the first Quran that was issued uh, in any serious way without the Arabic alongside it. It was designed to be done in the vernacular. Now, Atatürk's argument was that like the Protestants of Europe, when the people would be able to read the texts on their own, they'd come to their own evaluations about the morality, historicity, and validity of the Quran. Um, religious individuals at that time and today didn't quite see it that way. They saw it as a method of, uh, of forcibly deracinating uh, the Arabic heritage from those books. Additionally, because of the alphabet reform in 1927, Turks were increasingly finding it hard to read any text that was written in the Arabic alphabet, especially if they had only been taught in the Latin alphabet for Turkish. One of the other things that I didn't mention when I talk about when I talked about the alphabet is that not only did Atatürk convert uh, the alphabet to Latin script, he also purged the language of a significant percentage of its Arabic and Persian loanwords, opting instead to use historic Turkish words for the same meaning or words from French or English in order to disconnect Turks from uh, the Ottoman period and their understanding of Ottoman documents. In Atatürk's view, it also served to fortify their connection to uh, Turkish identity and heritage. The next thing that we should talk about is Devlet Çilek. Um, there are different translations of this. The most common I see is statism. But Devlet Çilek is much more about economics than it is about um, purely the representation of a state. Um, and so I think state capitalism is a better translation. Atatürk believed in a centralized government that would have a power to oversee the economic and social development of the country. That's not to say that he didn't believe in private enterprise. In fact, we have numerous private enterprises developing throughout Turkey in this period. But he believed that the mass, massive corporations that would really create large-scale social dividends uh, should be run by the state as a nationalized entity. The first uh, major such entity that he created was the Turkiye İş Bankası, or the Turkish, uh, or the Turkey Workers Bank. In so doing, uh, by creating this bank, it allowed loans to be given to a number of fledgling businesses in the sugar, glass, textile, paper, and steel sectors. The presence of a national bank also led to uh, the creation of piggy banks. People began to actually save money and changed financial culture and financial literacy within Turkey um, at Atatürk's, uh, at Atatürk's uh, pressure. There was also a central bank built in 1931, um, and both the Turkey Bankası and the Turkish Central Bank remain important entities in the development of the Turkish economy. The Turkish Central Bank um, was responsible for the valuation of Turkish currency, which was wildly cantankerous during this period um, because of the newness of the country and the untestedness of its abilities. Another major development that Atatürk wanted to do was rebuilding the infrastructure of the Ottoman Empire, or rather building it for the first time. The Ottoman Empire had a significant amount of railroad, railroads, but as we remember from our discussions of uh, World War I, 
the Ottoman Empire lacked any railroad in Anatolia east of Ankara, which is about two thirds of the country. And so uh, Atatürk uh, set about building numerous different train lines. You can see this is actually the construction of the Ankara Kayseri Sivas line, which connects Ankara, which is about one third away from the western side of the country, and Sivas, which is about one third away from the eastern side of the country. Um, and from Sivas, the line was extended to Erzurum, from Erzurum to Kars, and Kars to the border. But there were many other lines throughout the country that he built. In fact, he nearly doubled the amount of rail that the Tur uh, that Turkey had. In addition to this, he repaved almost all of Turkey's 13,000 kilometers of road and added additional 8,000 kilometers of road during his tenure in order to facilitate large scale communication throughout the country. But it wasn't just roads and railroads that he took uh, into interest in terms of infrastructure. He also built airports and airplanes. In fact, one of his adopted daughters, Sibiha Kukchen, who you can see in the upper right hand side, um, was uh, Turkey's first female fighter pilot. Um, during Atatürk's uh, presidency, he developed the Turkish Air Force and built the first indigenous Turkish planes. But it wasn't just infrastructure on this sort of transportational scale that he that he took seriously. He also took seriously the creation of large scale factories. Uh, he toured a number of, uh, of factories and he also nationalized the industries in both cotton and tobacco in order to create a large uh, export market. Uh, sorry, a, a large uh, production that could lead to an export market. In all, um, this could and this is one of his least spoken about, but probably most important contributions to the development of modern Turkey was the facilitation of its modern economic success and its robust political power through that economic success. And the last of the six arrows is Inkilapçilek, which is often translated as reformism, but I don't like that word. Um, I prefer revolutionism because inkilap is revolution or overthrowing of the government. Um, so, and it's much more severe than I would say reformism is. There's a question here, how was Atatürk able to finance all this simultaneously growth and development after a century of conflict? It's a really great question. Um, the first thing that Atatürk did is that he established, and we're gonna talk about the foreign relations, but he, since he established relations with a number of foreign entities, uh, he was able to procure loans from outside of the country. Additionally, because of all the wealth that had been confiscated uh, during the during World War I by the Turkish government from, in many cases, Armenians uh, who, and Greeks who had been deported, that wealth was poured into uh, these sovereign funds. And finally, um, the purchase of Turkey's exports funneled in money into the central banks um, which were able to then disperse it to the citizenry. So it's a combination of these three. All right, so in Kilapçilik or revolutionism, in the view of uh, Turkey under Atatürk, uh, there needed to be a move towards the West, that Turkey needed to abandon its past and needed to continually reinvent itself and push in the direction of democracy, in the question of Westernization, in the question, in, in the... Uh, and modernism, that they should burn the past and never look back. And in fact, um, in addition to how changing the alphabet and changing the vocabulary would create that break, also fundamental daily units were changed. Um, in the Ottoman Empire, a day was cut into 24 hours, but those hours were contingent on when the sun rose and when the sun set. So if you had a day on the, on the equinox, Yes, every hour is the same length. But if you have a day, for example, on the summer solstice, and let's say you have, uh, I don't know, nine hours of uh, sunlight and uh, 15 hours, yeah, and 15 hours of darkness, then um, by, by our counting, those nine hours would be subdivided into 12 hours that would be shorter, and those 15 hours would be subdivided into 12 hours that were longer, which is a headache for any normal person. But the day only shifts by a few minutes every day, so you sort of get used to how the time is changing, and it was much more effective for staggering 
uh, religious obligations in Islam, which are based on when the sun rises and sets. Now, by adopting the Western format of time, you are putting people in a different headspace. They, he also adopted the Western calendar. He also adopted the metric system for weights and measures. And that way he broke off a significant aspect of them from, uh, I said, uh, yeah, uh, aspect of that. Um, yeah, sorry. When I said solstice, I was thinking winter solstice. Um, and weights and measures. Again, people were disconnected from their past. As part of revolutionism, um, Atatürk gave people at least uh, at least nominal um, voice to what we in the United States would call First Amendment freedoms, especially the freedom of religion and conscience, um, but also freedom to petition, uh, freedom of assembly, freedom uh, of the press, and freedom of speech. Um, in fact, many of the restrictive aspects of speech uh, that we see in Turkey today are not from Ataturk's time, but later in the development of the Turkish Republic. And Ataturk deputized the military to be the defenders of this secularism, of this revolutionism, that if the country stayed strayed too far from the necessary revolution, that um, the military would be responsible would be responsible for compelling the General Assembly to accept that the revolution must continue. So we've talked about Ataturk's domestic policy. Um, and there's a famous quote from him, peace at home, peace in the world. Um, and this, of course, is the latter half of that, the peace in the world. So we've already talked about the um, a Turkish Soviet relationship that was uh, started in 1921 when they signed the treaties of Moscow and Kars. Following that, um, in 1935, uh, no, sorry, 1925, they signed a non aggression pact um, and they became relatively friendly countries. You can see that's Voroshilov uh, in, uh, in Turkey discussing with Ataturk the development of increased ties. You also have Ataturk reaching out to the other members of the Balkans in Europe, especially the new countries of Yugoslavia, uh, the new country of Yugoslavia, and the its historic rivals of Greece and Romania. In 1934, these countries, which had been working together uh, for over 10 years, um, decided to sign the Balkan Pact, which was a military pact designed. Um, to resist the increasingly aggressive desires of Italy, right? This was Italy had come under uh, a dictator named Benito Mussolini of the fascist party, um, who was making designs on the Balkans. And the Bulgarians were also um, seeming to have an itch to expand. Uh, Tsar Boris III and, um, of Bulgaria also had a, uh, had a weak spot for Italy because of his wife uh, being Italian. And because Bulgaria had lost war, had lost territory in both the Second Balkan War and in uh, the First World War, and and Bulgarians wanted to recover that. Despite this, um, the Ottoman Empire was able to sign non-aggression pacts with Bulgaria uh, throughout the 1930s. The Ottoman Empire also reached out to the east. Um, he met with uh, Reza Khan, and we're going to talk about him and his uh, efforts to modernize Iran next week. But he reached out to Iran, um, and uh, in fact, Reza took a lot of inspiration from what Ataturk had managed to do in Turkey. By the late 1930s, um, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan um, were willing to sign a pact to protect them both from Soviet influence, uh, British influence, and from the increasing influence of a third party, uh, the Nazis uh, in Germany, who were beginning to express their own wills and ambitions towards power uh, throughout the world. In fact, the British helped facilitate uh, these negotiations, knowing that at worst, um, this group would be uh, hostile towards the British, but also hostile 
towards the Nazis and the Soviets. And so in 1938, um, Ataturk's representatives signed on his behalf the Sadabada uh, Pact, which was signed in Tehran. And that pact created an alliance between uh, the various states um, that I just mentioned, uh, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. Ironically, when the pact would have been most useful in 1940, when the British and Soviets invaded Iran and toppled its government, um, none of the parties reacted. But that said, it indicates still uh, Mustafa Kemal's uh, import and impact uh, in Iran and the other eastern neighbors. In fact, Aminullah Khan, who was the ruler, who was the king of Afghanistan at the time, was also trying to emulate a number of Ataturk's reforms. Uh, both he and Reza Khan had less success than Ataturk did in promoting them. And finally, the letter on the right is from Einstein, um, and he wrote this letter in 1933. And the time is very clearly uh, why he wrote it. Hitler had just ascended to the chancellery in Germany. Uh, Einstein himself was able to get a job uh, in uh, the United States. He would teach as a professor of physics at Princeton University. But many Jewish uh, colleagues in both Germany and Austria were not as lucky. Um, and so he petitioned Atatürk um, to take the scientists um, into Turkey where they could live uh, peaceful and meaningful lives and where hopefully they could contribute to the Turkish economy. The letter was actually received by Ismet Nenu, um, and he scribbled on the bottom, uh, we, there's no way we can do this, we don't have the money for it, um, but the, and he was about to junk it when Atatürk saw the paper, he looked it over and said, there's no way we can't do this. Um, we need those scholars. And in fact, those Jewish uh, those 40 Jewish uh, professionals um, who were very skilled in their field, many of them ended up learning Turkish when they lived in Turkey. Um, they moved to Turkey and they uh, performed, uh, sorry, and they served as the crux upon which many major Turkish universities were founded. And those 40 were the first of many uh, Jewish refugees who came from Europe either prior to or during the Holocaust period um, in order to live out their lives in Turkey. Now, of course, World War II is slightly outside of the scope of Ataturk's life. He died in 1938. But it's worth pointing out that he set up the country to remain neutral during the war. Um, and in fact, Inunu uh, pers uh, pursued that as a general policy through much of World War II. Now, one of the, one of the Entente powers that uh, Turkey had the most difficult time dealing with was the British. And the reason they had difficulty dealing with the British was their conflict over the region of uh, southern Kurdistan today. At that time, it was called Mosul Vilayet for its largest city, Mosul, and Vilayet meaning province. And during the uh, Treaty of Lausanne discussions, there was a debate between Inunu, the representative of Turkey, and Lord Curzon, the representative of the United Kingdom, arguing that uh, the territory should go to Turkey or the British, respectively. Now, the real reason the British wanted the territory of Mosul was that Mosul had numerous discovered oil reserves. In fact, um, the territory was originally going to go to the French under the Sykes-Picot Agreement, but when the British discovered oil, they basically asked the French to give it up, and then the French discovered that the British had found oil there after giving it up, and so they demanded a 25% concession of the oil company, which the British gave them, and the Americans, who were so angry that the French and the British would make money, demanded a 20% concession, which they got too. Um, but the Turks wanted it because it had been a historic part of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire and did not have a significant Arab population. In fact, during the period of Turkification, Kurds were argued to be mountain Turks, right? Everybody in Turk Turkey is a Turk. Um, and Ataturk didn't just mean that in the sense of a Turkish citizen, but he meant that as an ethnic Turk as well, right? The process of Turkification is to turn everybody into Turks, and so the Kurds were Turks too. But since the Arabs were expelled from uh, were expelled from the territory, in that their lands became part of other controlled entities, the mandates, um, the Arabs were not part of the Turkification process. There are debates as to whether the economy was connected more towards the north and therefore 
made sense to integrate with Turkey or uh, connected more towards the South, whether the British who were there had the right of possession because those territories were taken in November of 1918 after the armistice at Mudros, which was in October of 1918, and whether um, it was the will of the Kurds to be part of the Turkish Republic. Now, we've talked about uh, Ataturk and his vision for Turkey during his 15 years of presidency. It's worth pointing out that he did have a number of people um, opposing his will and the will of the Jumhuriyet Halkapartisi, the Republican People's Party, which was his party. And you can see the symbol with the six arrows, the Alta Ok, that we just talked about. The strongest opposition to his reign came in 1924, and that was in rejection of his desire to dismantle the caliphate. Um, many uh, Turks who had fought with him during the Turkish War of Independence, like uh, Kazim Karabakir and Rauf Orbe, uh, believed that either the caliphate was important to maintain for the religious future of the country, or that it would be uh, it would be reasonable to remove the caliphate, but not so soon. That there should be a, a slower step before that happened. And so they created the Teraki uh, Perver Jumhuriyet Verkase, or the Progressive Republican Party, uh, and Kazim Karabakir became the head of that party. Because it was the only opposition to the CHP, it attracted a lot of more religious individuals and individuals resisting the nationalization of the Turks. So when the Sheikh Said rebellion broke out, and we'll talk a little bit about what that was, um, Ataturk turned on this party um, and held what was called the Independence Tribunal to try all of its members for sedition against the country. Some of their uh, reputations were healed later. Um, like Kazim Karabakir was actually uh, rehabilitated by Inunu uh, after Ataturk's death. Um, but in many cases, these individuals were put under house arrest and were absent from Turkish politics. There's a question, to what extent was there freedom of press, speech, et cetera, under Ataturk? It was pretty free. Um, I can't think of anything explicitly that was prohibited, um, except the kinds of things that you would expect to be prohibited, like uh, uh, calling out to riot against the government, um, those sort of things. But otherwise, it was pretty much permitted. Ataturk wanted to develop uh, a democracy as well um, at, instead of creating a one-party state. And so he uh, reached out to his friend Fethi Okyar uh, in 1930 in order to create a new party. And uh, Okyar did. Uh, that was the Serbest Jumhuriyet Verkase. But of course, since Okyar was a friend of Ataturk's, the party's main goals were primarily the same ones as Ataturk's were. Uh, it believed in Kilapchilik, this revolutionary uh, revolutionism, um, but because it was the only opposition party to Ataturk, again, a lot of religious individuals um, and nationalists of uh, na nationalities other than Turkish ended up swarming the party. And since the values of the party were not what uh, Okyar wanted, he ended up dissolving the party. But he didn't dissolve the party before the Menemen incident, in which a Turkish soldier, Mustafa Fehmi Kubilay, who you can see up there, was killed by uh, a Muslim fundamentalist um, who wanted the reinstitution of Islam as the central religion of Turkey. Moving on from that, we have the Sheikh Said revolt. And the Sheikh Said revolt was a revolt uh, led by none other than Sheikh Said, who was a Sunni from the uh, Shafi'i school. Remember, the, that's not the school that's recognized officially. And he gathered a number of Turkish tribes uh, in the area that you see circled there, that's in southeastern Turkey. Um, and he led a revolt in order to try and establish uh, either independence or autonomy for the Kurdish people. And there were a number of grievances that he brought up. The first was centralization. We've talked about under Devlet Çilek that the, that the Turkish Republic's goal was to centralize the entirety of the empire. Um, and that would take away the historic privileges that many 
uh, Kurdish groups had had in administering autonomously their territory during the Ottoman Empire. The number of Kurdish deportations that were con being considered, of course, the resettlement law would end up enforcing a number of those in 1934, but Kurds were immensely afraid of those. The Kurdish language was uh, thoroughly repressed. During the period of Ataturk, no public schooling uh, or radio transmissions could be Kurdish. All, they all had to be given in Turkish. The land that they had historically considered theirs was now under the authority of Turks, um, who were now calling them uh, Mountain Turks. There was a marginalization of their religions. Now, Sheikh Said himself was Zaza ethnically. It's a subgroup of Kurds. Um, and he had within his coalition a number of Alevis as well. Both the Alevis and the Shafi'i Sunnis were uh, marginalized in that their religions could not set up new centers of worship. Also, Ataturk had banned the majority of religious schools, including those that operated in the Kurdish regions, and those secularized schools were teaching them a Turkish curriculum, which Sheikh Said and a number of Kurds found objectionable. And also the Kurds have been politically ostracized. They were not really members of the CHP. Um, and if we remember that picture from all the way back when we talked about laicism, those Kurdish individuals who had been part of the Grand National Assembly during the Turkish War of Independence and had given their lives for free and independent Turkey were now no longer part of the political development of that new country. There's a question of when the hat law was enacted, was there any ban on veils or hijabs for women? There was, uh, I know that there are a number of bans on niqabs that existed in various regions of Turkey. Hijabs were banned in public spaces, but they were permitted in places of worship. But And the Sheikh Said revolt was put down in 1925, um, but not without a lot of bloodshed from both Turkish soldiers and uh, the rebels. More egregiously, in 1937, was what was called the Dersim Revolt, um, and following that, the Dersim Massacre. Now, Dersim is a region in the center of Anatolia uh, with a large Kurdish population. It was renamed under the resettlement law as Tunjeli, um, and uh, the Kurds of this region were for, uh, to be forcibly moved and reintegrated into other regions where they could uh, Turkify more effectively. The Kurds resisted and there was an armed confrontation. That armed confrontation resulted in both attacks by Turkish troops on the ground and aerial bombardment. Um, it's argued by Kurdish historians, not supported by Turkish historians, that among the bombs dropped were gas uh, uh, bombs um, that would poison and hurt those civilians. It's estimated that between 15,000 and uh, and 40,000, depending on whose numbers you believe, uh, Kurds died as a result of the Dersim massacre. And it is considered one of the worst atrocities uh, during Ataturk's power uh, in Turkey. In both cases, Ataturk um, ordered uh, the attacks, uh, those, to those to repress the Sheikh Said revolt in 1924 and those to repress the Dersim revolt in 1937. Ataturk was also responsible for the creation of the Armenian genocide denial policy. And he did this in several ways. The first one was that he pardoned a number of guilty parties, uh, either those that have been made guilty under the uh, Istanbul court martials of 1919 and 1920, um, or rehabilitating the names of those who were otherwise known to have committed those acts. Mehmed Rashid Bey, for example, was governor of Diyarbakir, and was one of the leading individuals responsible for the Assyrian genocide. Uh, Ataturk uh, gave him, uh, posthumously uh, returned his property to him and his family and named a street after him. Many individuals, especially those who joined the Grand National Assembly during the Turkish War of Independence, were um, uh, their records were cleaned by Ataturk. Another, uh, thing was that during the Turkish War of Independence, there were crimes perpetrated against Armenians that had resettled areas that had been taken by the French or taken by the Armenian government uh, during the Turkish War of Independence. One particular example is the city of Hajin, which before uh, World War I was an Armenian majority city. Armenians returned there after the war since it came under French occupation. 
After the French were expelled, uh, roughly 10,000 Armenians and Hajin were massacred, and the rest of the Armenians fled to areas under French control. Ataturk did not prosecute or uh, discuss in any meaningful way the massacres that occurred at Hajin or similar incidents. He was also in control of the Ottoman uh, of the uh, Turkish army when it retook Smyrna in September of 1922, and um, Greek soldiers at the point have argued uh, that they had corresponded with Turkish soldiers who had orders to burn Armenian and Greek houses and quarters. Um, if those orders had come, they would have come from Ataturk or the generals in his uh, retinue. Ataturk has, uh, did not claim a responsibility or apologize for what had occurred at Smyrna. And of course, during the Turkification, there was the goal to Turkify the land, literally, by changing the names of places. So all those, pla all those dots in uh, yellow are Greek names, all those dots in green are Armenian names. All those dots in blue are Kurdish names. There were also laws names um, that are not represented on this map that were all changed to Turkish names. In some regions, especially in the eastern part of Turkey, over 75% of the names of towns, cities, geographical features, rivers uh, were renamed to erase the historical presence of the non-Turkish people and solidify the Turkish connection to the land. So the question sort of becomes, why did Ataturk take on this policy? Now, in 1919, prior to the Treaty of Sevres, um, Ataturk actually recognized to a certain degree that the Armenian and Greek genocides had occurred. He called them atrocities at the Grand National Assembly um, and said that the Turkish nation should feel shame for having committed them. But that position completely changed after the Treaty of Sevres. There was a belief that accepting uh, the war guilt would result um, in the preservation of Turkish territory and the security of the Turkish nation. But the Treaty of Sevres proved that the Western Entente powers were not going to allow the Turkish nation to have national security. And so in the mind of Ataturk and in the mind of many Turks today, the accepting of the genocide, that it had happened, that it was a crime and that the Ottoman Empire perpetrated it and that many of the people who built the Turkish Republic were involved in it, um, would be uh, go along with some sort of uh, removal of sovereignty from the Turkish people, either giving over land or giving over money or giving over something else that the Turkish nation needs. And so that need to be intact uh, supersedes any human rights investigation that should uh, be undertaken. We also have the Alexandretta question. Now, we mentioned during the Turkish War of Independence that Alexandretta was this territory in Syria with a large Turkish population. And so it was subject to different laws and statuses um, starting uh, in the 1930s. Now, you can see from the map of the ethnic composition, and you can see by the percentages below, that the Turks would, uh, were the plurality of the population in Alexandretta. But actually, if you add up the Alawis, the Sunni Arabs, and the Melkites, you have a larger population of Arabic-speaking people. The Armenians, Circassians, Jews, and Kurds all spoke their own languages. Now, those populations were relatively mixed. And there was a plebiscite that would be held in the in 1936 as to what should happen. And what ended up happening was the creation of a, a separate colony of, uh, of Hatay um, that would be run jointly by a Turkish and local uh, commission. However, the Syrian people outside, and we'll talk about this uh, in about a month when we talk about uh, the French Levant, the Syrian people rejected the partition of Hatay uh, or Alexandretta um, from the rest of Syria. It didn't matter though. The French were afraid um, much more of Germany in 1936 to 1939 than they were of any Syrian insurrection. And that fear of the Nazis uh, led to them trying to seek Turkey as a potential ally. And if not potential ally, at least not an enemy. And by giving the Turks control over Hatay, they felt they could buy uh, that relationship. And so in, on the 5th of July, 1938, just after Ataturk had died, Ismet Yenunu uh, committed forces to invade Alexandretta, exactly as Ataturk had heated up for him. 
Now, of course, you can see that there's an Armenian population in Alexandretta, and that population surged as a result of Armenians fleeing from things like the Hajian massacres. But knowing that they would come under Turkish control again, most of those Armenians fled further still into Aleppo and other areas of Syria closer, um, but still under French control. So the last thing I want to address is the personality cult. One of the things that's well known about Atatürk, in addition to him having pictures and statues everywhere, is that there is the law number 5816, which prevents any negative depiction of Atatürk uh, within Turkey. And in fact, YouTube was banned from 2007 to 2010 within Turkey for running afoul of this law, right? It has content that portrays Atatürk in a negative light. Eventually, it was overruled and YouTube was allowed to stand in Turkey. Um, but what's interesting about the personality cult that developed around Atatürk is that most of it developed after he died. Most personality cults that we see develop primarily when the person is alive. And in fact, the personality cult was most embraced by the opposition to the CHP, uh, the Democratic Party. And we'll talk about that when we finally get to the 1950s and 60s. Uh, which is probably going to be never um, at this rate. But um, the opposition created their support of Atatürk in order to distance themselves from Inyanu and his and their current rivals uh, in the 50s and 60s, to say that they are also supporters of the Turkish Republic, that they also believe in the vision of Inkilapçilik, of eternal revolutionism. Atatürk's quotes have become a staple of Turkish society this, um, and are used to, uh, by many Turks to advocate uh, their specific view of the future. Of course, Nemutlu Türkim DNA remains that statement of uh, avowed Turkishness, happy is he who says he is a Turk. You also have Manavi Mirasim, Ilim ve Akildir, my moral heritage is science and reason. Uh, right, trying to say that what he gave the Turkish nation was that. And also, uh, when Atatürk uh, died on the 10th of November, there is an annual procession that goes through Ankara. I think this is the procession from 2017, um, uh, where you see Erdogan uh, leading uh, the population of Turkey in, in Ankara uh, in a procession to commemorate Atatürk's death. There are also laws uh, requiring his picture in businesses. Um, and in many cases, this personality cult has developed into a national reverence for the, for the person. There's a question here. The paradox of Atatürk seems to be that most of the westernization democratization was accomplished via authoritarian edict, possibly rubber stamped by legislative authority. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good um, uh, discussion of what he did. In fact, Atatürk's one main political failure in his view was that he couldn't establish an opposition party. And opposition parties really wouldn't become a part of the Turkish Republic until after World War II. So, oh, and I timed this perfectly today. Questions, comments, concerns, put those in the chat. Um, I will address the question about Atatürk being religious as well. Um, and while you're formulating those questions, um, I'll discuss a little bit about who we are as history, history, mostly ancient discussions. And I will put our contact information in the chat as well, for those of you who are interested. Um, I teach a series on Middle Eastern Islamic history every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time. We also discuss Greco-Roman civilization, Asian philosophy, European Union security, powerful women, arms and armor, dead languages, all these kinds of things um, at their appropriate times. You can see those there. And you can think of us almost like a CNN uh, with all these different offerings. Um, they're all run by different people who have different aspirations in terms of how we communicate and what we're trying to communicate with regards to history in our own selected genre. But we work together to have uh, a single channel where we can put up our information. We also have a number of short run series. We're gonna talk about the war in Ukraine uh, in October. Uh, we've done four episodes before on Ukraine with a panel, including a number of military uh, experts and um, people who've come from Russia. Um, 
there is uh, our cru my Crusade series that I did, and uh, there's Ancient Greece, uh, and there's also older series. Um, I actually tried to estimate it. I think we have something close to 350 hours of content. Uh, so if you're ever bored on a Sunday and you just want to cram those 350 hours in, you're good to go. Um, so back to questions. Um, so there's the question of, is Ataturk religious or is he atheistic? Ataturk left a number of comments in his life that are contradictory on this point. So he never outrightly said, I'm an atheist. He also never outrightly said, um, I pray or, or stuff like this. He definitely identified as a Muslim. And he said that on numerous occasions. He did say um, that religion has no part to play in politics. He also, as you could see from that quote, he believed very strongly in science um, and reason as the development of the state. Um, in fact, one, another one of his famous quotes is, uh, if, any, if uh, you find that science and I have come to a disagreement, trust science. Um, so you have this sort of view, which would be very typical of an atheist. Um, but as he never made a formal declaration of it, it's not clear. There are, uh, it also bears mentioning that conspiracy theorists argue that because he was born in Salonika, where there was a large Dunmeh community, Dunmeh was a sect of Jews that converted to Islam about 400 years ago, um, that he might be Jewish. Um, there's no evidence to suggest that he was Dunmeh, uh, even though there was a large Dunmeh community in Thessaloniki when he was growing up there. That community, of course, now all lives uh, in Turkey um, because of the population exchange in 1923 between Greece and Turkey. Um, regardless of uh, his views of religion in public space, in private spaces, he believed that there was a place for religion and that many people need religion. Um, so it's it's unclear whether or not he's religious. I personally believe he was an atheist. I think the evidence leans more that way. But um, there are, this is a huge debate in Ataturk historiography. All right, any other questions? Thank you for, by the way, for all the kind remarks. Um, there's a question, did Ataturk endorse Turks drinking alcohol? It's odd how Raka is almost the national drink. I don't know if he endorsed Turks drinking alcohol. Like, I don't think he did any campaigns or something. Um, but Ataturk was an extremely heavy drinker. He drank all the time. Um, and in fact, he died from cirrhosis of the liver. That, that was what did him in. Um, he certainly made no effort to ban alcohol. In fact, he repealed a number of the laws that would have uh, lessened its effect. And Raka was one of his drinks of choice. So um, it's ironic in the current day and age that many of the laws that Ataturk did to sort of remove religion from the public square have started to creep back in in forms of curfews. And there's a debate as to whether the failed military coup in 2016 was because there, because regardless of whether that coup was real or not, and I'm inclined to believe that the 2016 coup was fake, uh, but uh, regardless of whether that coup was real or not, there were a, there was a lot of talk among the Turkish military elite of overthrowing um, Erdogan as defenders of the Inkilapçilik of the uh, uh, revolutionism. Um, because of this slow return of non-secular laws. So before I close out, I'm just going to talk about what we have coming up. Uh, this Sunday at uh, at 12 p.m. Eastern time is the last in our Islam 101 series for the moment. Uh, and it will be a Q&A where I ask Sabil Ahmed uh, a number of questions that I think are interesting um, about uh, about Islam that sort of goes beyond the 101 that we sort of talked about and goes into sort of deeper questions about how does Islamic law work, how, what do Muslims feel, these kinds of things. Um, then uh, this upcoming Thursday, uh, as I hinted at, uh, I'm going to give the presentation of Reza Khan or Reza Shah Pahlavi, who took power in Iran in 1921 um, and was removed from power by the Soviets and the British in 1940. And so I'm going to discuss his uh, period of rule um, 
and how uh, he developed. Um, if you're interested in the previous period, episode 42 on the Qajar dynasty will be instructive. Um, and following that, I'm going to, the next Thursday, I'm going to give a presentation on the formation of Saudi Arabia. Following that, I'm going to take a three-week vacation and then come back on the 13th um, of October uh, discussing the French uh, Middle East. We also have our Asian philosophy series, which uh, continues on Saturday nights, our Greek philosophy series, which continues on Monday nights. We have uh, on the 9th of September, I believe, uh, whatever that Saturday is, at uh, 12 o'clock, we have the next in our Dead Languages series. We're going to cover, I believe, Sumerian. And yeah, so we have a lot. Uh, and of course, we have Wu uh, We're going to give a pr uh, presentation on her as part of our pr uh, Powerful Women series sometime in September. Uh, all of those events are in our uh, meetup, so you can find those there. And uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for your questions. Um, I, I thank you my, uh, a lot for this comment. Uh, I lived in Turkey for two years in the mid '60s, uh, doing a PhD, and uh, and I've clarified a lot for you. That's that's really amazing. Um, I've used the term Entente powers. Um, somebody's asking what are the Entente powers? Entente refers to uh, the side of the British, French, Americans, and Tsarist Russia uh, and Italy in World War One. Uh, the the agreement between Russia, France, uh, and Tsarist Russia. Before the war was what was called the Entente. Um, a lot of times they're called the Allies, but I find that really confusing because the Turks also had allies. So are the allies of the Turks not allies? It's like, it's just sort of weird. So I call them the Entente powers because they were sort of the ideological descendants of that Entente agreement uh, in 1913. All right. So if there's no more questions, I'm going to close this out. Thank you everybody for coming and I really enjoy all the heart for heartwarming words. Um, hopefully I'll see you either on Sunday or next week and uh, bye.